Hi, welcome to Mr. Dyer's Museums. I'm Mr. Dyer, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Scouting Cook Kits. And if you notice, I said cook kits, not mess kits. So we're going to be examining the history of these, we're going to take a look at them, and we're even going to share with you a recipe from the 1925 Boy Scout Handbook, and we're going to use all the pieces of this. So, let's take a look. As always, I'd like to thank my wife and family for their unconditional support. I'd like to thank you guys, my viewers, for taking the time to check this video out. If you're new to this channel, check out all my other videos. I have a ton of early camp craft videos and Civil War videos. So if you like artifacts, if you like antiques, and you like to learn about them and how they were used, maybe material culture appeals to you like it does me, then this is the channel for you. So if you like it, please click like, please subscribe, and please leave us a comment. You know, let us know. Uh, the time that you might have used a cook set of some sort. Maybe it's just a funny story. I'd like to thank my patrons on Patreon for making this video possible. Uh, I'd like to welcome our new patron, Rich. I appreciate your support. On this channel, we take the money that the patrons uh, give us and we put it aside so we can take the show on the road. And I did a video a few weeks back where we examined the, uh, or we went to see and visit the Newark Earthworks, and we talk to a professional there. So it's not always me that's going to be talking. Okay, so what we have here is the Boy Scout Cook Kit, not mess kit as it's commonly called. Now, even I, I always call them mess kits because, you know, military background, it influences civilian life, and that's just how it is. The difference between a mess kit and a cook kit, a mess kit was issued out to soldiers so that you could receive your ration and you could eat as part of a mess. Now, the military mess kits could easily be used for cooking, um, but traditionally mess kits were used uh, for eating in a mess, everybody coming together, either in a line or um, maybe pitching in, like during the American Civil, Civil War, I did a video of that, of what a mess was. Um, so that's a mess kit, but this is a cook kit. It has all the bits and pieces that are designed specifically for cooking. Now, the Boy Scouts of America started in 1910 and the Boy Scouts used the cook kits to cook for independently um, but the major focus on the scouting program is on patrols. Now in a patrol you usually have boys of six to eight, you know, six to eight boys and that's going to consist of a patrol and you would always camp as a patrol, you would cook as a patrol, you would do various other tasks as a patrol, even patrol games. So it's very much kind of like a mess. So generally your patrol equipment would include bigger pots and pans so you can actually cook for um, more than just one or two people. Now, there were times where scouts had to prepare food uh, for themselves. And uh, there were requirements, and there's the cooking merit badge, where scouts had to learn how to prepare meals for themselves, not just the patrol. So in that situation, the cook kit uh, was very practical and a lot of times scouts may join other troops maybe at a national jamboree or the world jamboree and uh, in those situations of course you cook as a patrol but having your own plate uh, your own cup th that comes pretty handy so this was just a great all-around useful set for a scout to have now these type of kits generally speaking get a bad reputation and I think that's because after the 1960s, the Boy Scouts of America contracted out and the aluminum that was used for these cook kits, cook kits were much thinner. In fact, the aluminum kits that you get real cheap at your big box stores, uh, they're a very thin aluminum compared to what these are. And I don't think a lot of scouts were actually taught how to cook purposely with an aluminum cook kit. So we're going to discuss that as well. But before we do that, we're going to talk about the history. Now the company that made these was the Wherever Company. And Wherever started in 1903. Got to get my dates right. 1903. And, uh, and by 1912, the U.S. 
Marine Corps actually adopted the Wherever Mess Kit as their distributor. So that really exploded Wherever as well. But in 1903, that's when Wherever, which was part of the American Aluminum Corporation, uh, came together and uh, they started producing, mass producing aluminum cookwares and aluminum wares. Now before that, aluminum was pretty expensive. By 1825, uh, we had the, the knowledge of how to make aluminum, but it was just really expensive. And there was a very short period of time in history where aluminum was a semi-precious metal, which is why if you find some really old straight razors that had uh, cast aluminum scales, that was actually kind of a sign of class. They fell out of favor rather quickly um, because aluminum became so cheap to make almost overnight with the processes that was actually developed here in Ohio. My great state of Ohio has given us a lot of stuff and that's one of the things is the processes of how to mass produce aluminum. So getting back to the Wherever Company, Wherever patented this set in 1915 and the Boy Scouts used this same exact design up until the 1960s and then the design for the most part stayed the same, but there were some nuances that changed. And again, the, uh, the gauge of aluminum became much thinner and a response a lot more difficult to use for cooking. So I have three examples of the cook sets here that I'm going to show you. And all of them are pretty much the same as far as the kit, but the covers differ kind of slightly. So this one here, is I believe to be my oldest one and it actually doesn't have any type of Boy Scout marking. So I suspect that this is a civilian um, kit case but the set inside of it is actually a Boy Scout uh, kit. So it has a civilian snap when you pop that open it opens this up and it has a nice quality strap that you can carry to your side so you don't have to use the space in your knapsacks. And knapsacks in the 1920s and 30s were much smaller. So having this made it um, uh, a little bit easier to carry so you can actually carry your more important items in your bag. The kit, the cover is made of a drill, a cotton drill, which is a very durable material. Inside it has a little pocket with a divider. Now the pocket had these two uh, utensils. It came with a spoon and it came with a fork. And as you can see from the handle of the fork, like these are smaller, but they're, they're, they're usable. You know, they're very functional. It's a four prong fork and it has like a, a plastic handle here, probably bake light if I had to suspect. And it has a, a tinned steel spoon. So the spoon is rather heavy, but you could stick your utensils in like that and in with the kit and have everything all in one. Now all the kits are designed just like this. You have a metal strap that's going to be your handle for your skillet. You have the top portion which is going to be your bowl or plate. It has a wing nut that locks it into place and underneath that wing nut are two divots. So when you actually open this up and you tighten it, or if you like this and you tighten it, the handle's not going to move. So that makes it really useful, especially when using it over the fire. So you loosen up the wing nut like so, and there's a little snap. And this is a high quality snap compared to what the uh, contemporary examples are. And you can bring that around, and now you have your skillet. Pop that open, you have your bowl or plate. Now, Almost all these pieces have the Boy Scout logo on it. The bull has number 168 wherever aluminum and tack U Co. Made in the USA. And like I said, it has the Boy Scout logo. And then you have your little pot, your little bush pot. Now this says number two, three, four, same different, same markings. Beyond the number, this is your cup. The cup does not come 
with any marking. However, there's an enterprising or smart young scout, or maybe mom or dad or scout master, but there's a scratch on the inside of this cup. And when I poured the water up to that, and then I poured it into a measuring cup, that's one cup. So a half inch down from the rim is a full cup. So you could even use this as a practical uh, measuring device. And it has a nice little finger loop, which one of the nice things about this not being actually connected to the bowl of the cup itself is it cools down faster when you have hot items. And it has a lid with a little metal pull tab so you can open it up. And then you have your skillet yourself. Now the skillet itself also is marked. This says number 888 wherever made in the USA and the Boy Scout logo. So now you can screw the wing nut down like so and you have yourself a very nice skillet. Now the problem is, is this is a um, heavy duty handle. So unless you have something heavier in here, it does tend to tip. So you're having uh, some weight on it. What you can also do is you can take this handle and you can flip it upside down by unscrewing the wing nut. And then you have this, it'll be equal with the base of your skillet. Um, it'll be a little bit harder to pull on and off but you can use it. Another thing you can do is it has holes here, so you can make a makeshift uh, skillet handle. You can even lengthen it out if you need to, uh, to help take it off if it's in the upside side down position. So that's pretty handy. And like I showed in my 1910 mess kit video, this kit is very useful as a makeshift Dutch oven. It has this lid here, which I bake bread, you know, just make sure it's, it's elevated on the heat. But you can use this as a spacer, put your dough on there, and uh, that will help you bake your bread without um, burning it. Okay, so you have your skillet, you have your pot, you have your cup, you have your plate. Now if you take out everything, like I said, you put your bowl on top there, bring it over so, screw it down just a little bit, it doesn't even need to be all the way down, just so that it catches that clasp. Now you have yourself your Dutch oven. Just put some coals on top, put the, I would elevate this, but you put your coals on the bottom, if nothing else, use the spacer, and there you go. And you have all that you need here. So I believe this is the earliest one that I have. Um, if I had to guess, due to the implements being used, made with Bakelite, I would say it's probably 1920s. But the patent date is 1915. But all of them, up until they, the transition to 1960, where they changed the handle, the handle's got the divots in it, they all say patented in 1915, because that's when wherever patented it and they've made them over a long period of time. The second example I have, and I'm not going to take all the implements apart because they're exactly the same, but the cover as you can see it has the uh, divot here so that the piece where your um, wing nut is can rest in there. So it still has that. This one is the official Boy Scout mess kit. It's faded, but there was a little circle with an emblem in there. It also has the Boy Scout snap. Now this Boy Scout snap is very indicative of what was uh, sold on other implements with snaps, like the, mess, the sewing kits. It was the late 1930s and into the 1940s. So I'm going to date this mess kit uh, to that time period. But if we were to take it out, it also has the little pouch for the fork and spoon. Okay, so you got your long strap so a kid can still carry it. Now the uh, the buckles 
of the older one that I have, the example, is a little bit more stout than these. These ones are still good. They're not flimsy metal, but uh, this other one that I showed you before that I believe is older had the buckles that were a little bit more stout. Now the last one I have for you is this one here. It does not have a Boy Scout button on it. It just has a plain little snap. The fabric seems to be um, thinner than the other two examples. It does have the Boy Scout logo with the New York at the bottom. If we open this up, as you can see, there's not a point on the bottom for the wing nut. We take the case or the kit out, and we look at the inside. At this point, there's no pouch for the silverware for the utensils. Now this one is all steel. This is all steel, which is nice um, for cooking. Now this is where I'm going to give you the difference and I, why I think a lot of people have trouble with the aluminum mess kits. Aluminum conducts heat almost twice as much or twice as fast as steel. So you just have to be aware about that heat transfer and how long things are going to cook or how high you really need to be to the heat source for the metal to conduct and cook whatever you're cooking on. This one has a top strap and it says, after use, clean and dry thoroughly. Final oil, oil or grease lightly to prevent rust. Now, so this is a steel one. I know uh, other YouTubers tend to like the steel one. Steel one works great, it's just a lot heavier. Honestly, for packing, I prefer the aluminum. As long as you practice and you know how to cook with it, it does just as well as this one. The aluminum doesn't rust. Horace Kephart even made a mention about aluminum. He preferred enameled steelware in the early 1900s. Aluminum was nice, it was new on the scene, everything was being uh, made out of aluminum is like the, the time period's titanium because it was super light but as Horace Kephart said when you take a drink of your morning coffee with aluminum you're you got to be aware of that because you could scald your mouth so just be careful and if you've ever done that once then you, you get flashbacks you never want to do it again so on the bottom of this mess kit on the top lid it doesn't have any markings and with these you always have to season them you got to keep them oiled if we look at the pot here it also does not have any markings and we can take a look around no no markings whatsoever you can see the solder marks still has the bail and something I forgot to mention on the bail it does have little divots so you can kind of snap it into place so it stays wherever you want to put it so that's pretty handy the cup is differently now again this is a steel cup so it's heavier duty if you notice the finger hole is now connected and this one's perfectly rounded instead of more like a teacup shape and it holds less fluid than the aluminum kit bowl you've got your lid now the lid on this one the tab is actually done a little bit differently it is, uh, it is soldered to the top instead of having wings on the bottom to hold it and you have your skillet like so so the nice thing about it being a, a metal or steel at this point is that tipping problem that I told you about you don't have to worry about it because this is steel this is heavier or as heavy as the handle itself so when you put this on the ground as long as you balance it um, you don't have the weight distribution problem like the aluminum had so there's your skillet now no matter which one you get the aluminum or the steel um, they're great kits the steel one is made out of steel because this was made and first offered to the Boy Scouts during 1942. And there's an important event in our world history that was going on during 1942, and that was World War II. 
and aluminum became a, um, a metal that was prized, especially during scrap drive, because the war effort needed aluminum for um, military applications like planes. Okay? So Boy Scouts for a period of time stopped making the aluminum mess kits. They only produced the steel ones. And so they're a little bit less common than the aluminum ones. But uh, the steel ones can also be narrowly dated really to the period of World War II. Because after World War II, which ended in 1945, aluminum became a readily commercial resource again. So aluminum was then allowed to be used for civilian purposes, such as making the mess kits. Okay, so now we have all the parts. We're gonna take a look at how to use these pieces to make a recipe from 1925 Boy Scout Manual. We're going to be making hot cocoa because the Boy Scout Manual has the directions for it. And you know, if you're a Boy Scout, hot cocoa tastes pretty good. We're also gonna be taking a look at making hoe cake. Now, I've never had a hoe cake until I really made this recipe, and it's pretty good, okay? Uh, something you just gotta keep in mind is you don't want to use too much grease in the bottom of your pan when you put the hoe cake on the pan. You really want it to be super light. That way the corn cake or the hoe cake doesn't uh, soak up that grease and give it kind of a, a nasty, greasy flavor. And it also will be make, make it more difficult to flip. So minimum amount of grease is the best way to make it, as we will see. Now aluminum ware conducts heat twice as fast. So when you cook these things, you just got to be aware of how hot things will get. You may need to elevate, especially higher from your heat source, or maybe use less uh, coal or wood ash or whatever on top if you're using like a Dutch oven, which I explained in my last video with the 1910 mess kit. But this is a fantastic piece of kit. I suggest my scouts get on eBay and try to find them. Check it out on flea markets. Uh, garage sales, things like that. They're awesome. They're all encompassing and they're fairly light. It's really all that you need for your personal uh, cooking system whenever you go out, especially by yourself. Okay. Now you can use this to cook for uh, maybe two people and I've done that and without a problem. But as a grown man, I can cook enough food on all these different pieces and it fills me up perfectly fine. And folks, I, I could probably spare some weight, if you know what I mean. So this mess kit for a young boy is perfect, it's ideal. As a grown person, it's perfect, it's ideal. I suggest you get it. And give the aluminum a second chance if you're an old boy scout and you just didn't know how to cook on it or maybe um, you had some bad experiences. Life's all about practice. I suggest practice, practice, practice. All right, let's take a look at how to make those recipes. Now. Horace Kephart, in his book, he talks about aluminum cookware in the early 1900s, and he preferred the enamelware. Because aluminum has almost twice the conductivity of heat as steel. So he uses the example of drinking a cup of coffee, and you scald your lips from the aluminum. So when you cook with aluminum cook kits, you just have to know that. You just, just you have to be aware, okay, I'm not cooking at home on a stainless steel pot or even cast iron. Aluminum's going to conduct heat rather quickly, so you need to keep the temperature lower. You may need to cook it a little bit longer in some circumstances uh, so it doesn't burn or scald. Uh, it's just a different way of cooking that you have to get used to. Okay, so wherever made these cookies, and they made these cookies up until the 1960s. Uh, then, you know, things kind of went different and the gauge of aluminum started getting thinner and cheaper and to what you got today. So if you are going to buy a Boy Scout cook kit, I would strongly suggest you get some of the older ones, you know, made by wherever and even the, uh, the newer ones that the divots, they're still really good. Okay. So this one, like I said, it has the date patented 1915. In fact, all the ones that I have have the patent date of 1915. All right, so let's take a look at what all these cook kits have in common. So you'll see that there is a nut on cook kit. So as you unscrew it, that frees the handle. As you can see, there's a little metal tab there. There's a little metal notch, and that's what locks it in place. 
and there's two little nubs uh, on the either side of the screw and that's what's used to hold the skillet in place once you screw it back in. So once you remove that you have the plate pan and almost all of them, if I can get it, are marked with the Boy Scout logo that you can see there. That's the first class emblem. Next, you have the pot. The pot goes in upside down. And the pot has a little tab, full tab. It's a very loose lid. You open that up. One of the cool features about this pot is the little ears are divoted, so it kind of locks the bale in place. So that's kind of nice. And next, you have an aluminum cup that fits inside the bowl. So all the cook kits have those pieces. Now, if you hold that and you screw it like so, the skillet, uh, didn't get in the nubs all the way, the skillet handle doesn't move. And that's a big plus compared to our modern Boy Scout cook kits or the lookalikes. You know, they have that, but they, they don't work quite as well and as securely as this one does. So now you have your own personal size skillet. And for a boy, or even a full grown man like myself, you know, as long as you plan your meals accordingly, you can get full cooking on this set. A lot of people say, ah, it's small, it's not big enough for um, a full size meal. I have no problems eating food off of this and being completely satisfied, even after a full day of hiking. Okay. Let me resituate here. Okay, so today, um, besides this cook kit, there's not a whole lot of historical props that I have uh, for this video and this cooking demonstration. We're going to be using a gas, white gas, Coleman stove. And I don't even know what date it is. If I had to guess, it was probably the 70s, 80s, might even be the 90s. Okay, so it's very new um, in comparison to most of the other antiques that I have on here. But since the focus isn't so much on skill of fire building and cooking on a fire, like I did last time, um, I, this just simplifies things a lot. Okay, and let's be honest. When you go camping today, for the most part, you're gonna have some type of stove, even if it's a personal backpacking stove, okay? So today, we're gonna to be making two things, and they both come from the 1925 Boy Scout manual. This guy right here. The first are hoe cakes. Now, I've never had a hoe cake before because I live in the north. We don't really eat a whole lot of hoe cakes, but we are gonna make a hoe cake today for the demonstration. We're also going to be making a hot chocolate, which even in the Boy Scout manual in 1925, it says that boys should drink hot chocolate in place of tea or coffee. But coffee is not something that's encouraged for the boys to be drinking. So we're gonna be making hot cocoa and we're gonna be using all the different parts of the cook kit to do that, okay? Now let's talk about the ingredients list. What we have for the hoe cake, you'll need cornmeal, you'll need lard. I would strongly suggest you actually go to the store and you find some lard instead of trying to use Crisco or another substitute. Um, lard really does taste better in this recipe than um, other things. And I, I tried it several times because I didn't have lard, okay? So actually stick with the recipe for the best result, use lard. We're gonna be using our old time favorite, which we did a video on. We're gonna have sweetened condensed milk and a little bit of salt. And that's gonna be all you need for your hoe cake with the exception of water. Now for the hot cocoa, since we are opening up a can of sweetened condensed milk, we're going to use that according to the recipe and we're going to have cocoa and that's it. And again, some water. So as you can see, 
the mix is already made, you know, just for the ease of purpose. And I, I made this in the house just to test it out and make sure that everything was good before I did this video. So full disclosure, the mix is already made. But I am going to go through the recipe and the different parts of how you would do it um, on the stove. Now, this pot here is going to be used for your heating up the water. Now, in the recipe, it asks for warm water, not hot water. And honestly, if you keep your canteen outside and out of a cooler or something and during the summer, that temperature of water is perfectly fine. It does not need to be heated up. But for our cocoa, we are going to heat up water. That way, um, well, it's hot cocoa after all, right? So this is going to be our mixing bowl that we would use for this recipe. Now this recipe makes a lot of hoe cakes. It could easily feed one person um, and you'd have plenty of leftovers. So I would suggest getting with one or two other people and sharing this recipe and uh, you know go from there. But it makes plenty for one person. This cup here, now believe it or not, it is a true cup up to about like a quarter of an inch. Um, and there must have been a scout at some point who knew that. And uh, I don't know, smarter than me, I honestly wouldn't have thought about it. They scratched in a line where the cup would be. So that right there, I guess it would be more of a half inch down. That would be a cup. Now a pint is what's used in the example of the book. And one, a half pint equals a cup. So just keep that in mind when we talk about it. So this would be a half pint, not a full pint. You would need two of those. Now in the book on page 255. Make a thick batter by mixing warm, not scalding water or milk with one pint of cornmeal and mix in with this a small teaspoonful of salt and a tablespoonful of melted lard. To cook hoe cake properly, the frying pan should be perfectly clean and smooth inside. If it is not, too much grease will be required in cooking. Scrape it after each panful is cooked and then only occasional greasing will be required. Greasing is best done with a clean rag containing butter. Spread a thin batter in the pan with a spoon so that the cake will be very thin. Disturb it as little as possible, and when the cake is firm on one side, turn it and cook on the other. All right. So we have our batter here. Now, if you've never worked with cornmeal before, it's not like flour. It has a very gritty um, texture to it. So with my experimentation and maybe historically speaking uh, the cornmeal was ground a little bit finer than what we get today but this works the best if you get it too thin um, it takes really long time to cook and it doesn't uh, firm up very well so this is the right consistency to me for the hoe cake that we're going to make today so that's about enough time for the stove to heat. We're going to turn down the temperature and we're going to get the water on on one side for the hot cocoa. Now in the recipe it, it talks about using um, a condensed milk. Now, a lot of those recipes and historical recipes that I even looked in Horace Kephart's book, if you take condensed milk, which is very sweet, and you water it down with water, you stir it up, it works really, really well. And it gives a nice dimensional flavor for sweetness to the end result. Okay, so we have our pan here. As you can see, the weight is off kilter because of the handle. Now, once we get the hoe kicks in there, uh, that'll be very different. The weight of the food will keep it down. But just know that the handle is uh, going to weigh it down. 
And again, because it's aluminum, it's going to heat up faster, almost twice as fast as steel due to its conductivity. So we're just going to take a little bit of lard, not much at all, pour in that teaspoon. Now honestly, whatever is not used, because we're wanting a super thin coating, we'll actually just dump out. We are good to go. So we're gonna take our batter here. And I think it's kind of dried out a little bit now. We're gonna add a little bit of water. It's a little too thick. Not much at all. Just to hydrate it a little bit. I just don't think it being soupy works quite well. Okay, I'm gonna drop it on there. I'm gonna flatten it like that. Another one there. And we'll try this one first, just a couple. And then we'll do one big one, just so that you can see the difference, you know, how they cook and how they easy they are to flip. Now, as you can see from the color and everything, I had way too much grease in here. When I talked about in the uh, directions, you know, when it's thin, if you watch that video about halfway, I tipped this skillet back because I noticed there was a pool of grease that I didn't see before. Um, and I forgot to dump it out before I put the, uh, the droplets in. But this is gonna be a very greasy hoe cake. And as you can see, it's not really sticking together like it should. So this is kind of a flop. So let's try this again after we'll get this cleaned out. Try something different. Okay, so our water is hot enough for hot cocoa. So we're gonna shut that side off and we're going to prepare a cup. Now the easiest thing I think personally to do, you know, if you put the powder in first, the powder's not gonna clump on you. And that's pretty ideal. You can always dip the water in and then put the powder and put the milk in. Um, I think that's what I'm gonna do in this particular circumstance. So I have my cup. I'll put the lid on. I'm gonna put that there. Now, it says for cocoa, Allow a teaspoon of cocoa for every cup of boiling water. Mix the powdered cocoa with the water or boiled milk with sugar to taste. Boil two or three minutes. Cocoa, chocolate, and malted milk are recommended in place of coffee in all Boy Scout camps. Okay, so in this circumstance, what I would do is I put the teaspoon of cocoa, 
This is for an individual. So I have my teaspoon. I'm going to put that in there. Next. I already poured some sweetened condensed milk in there. So I'm going to take my little plastic container. I'm going to put all that in there. That's going to thicken it up. It's also going to sweeten it. Now this, as you can see, is starting to crack, so it should be ready to flip. And hopefully, it's not going to be as greasy. See, it's sticking together a lot better, and that is not as greasy. If you remember the other one, the color was not as this dark. It was a, more of a mm, dandelion color, so this is good. That's what we're kind of going for. That over feels about right so there you have it that's one hoe cake all right guys so we have our awesome all right so let's take a look well <laughs> let's watch me take a bite of this and tell you what i think of it okay i'm gonna give you my honest opinion now i made this and instead of with straight milk or straight water i did a little bit of uh, sweetened condensed milk and I watered it down. Because I was trying to think, you know, when you're backpacking, you're trying to take as few things as possible. And if you open up a can of sweetened condensed milk, you have to use it, right? It's going to be very difficult to store it. So in my other video about sweetened condensed milk, I talked about using it for coffee, things like that. Well, the sweetened condensed milk with just this, you know, inside of it, it adds a little bit of sweetness. So it's pretty good in that regard. It's gritty. If you never had a hoe cake, if you're not familiar with using cornmeal, it has a little bit of a grit to it. But it's not offensive at all. But by itself, it's pretty good. It certainly needs something to top it. So what I'm thinking is I'm going to put some of this sweetened condensed milk on it as a topping. So let's see what we got here. All right, so there's the sweet and condensed milk. So that's, um, <laughs> now we're cooking. I got a sweet tooth though, to my detriment. Now, putting sweet and condensed milk on this thing, I don't have any sources to give you to tell you that that was done. It makes sense to me because, well, you got it, right? But I do have a primary source about using sweetened condensed milk on hardtack. When I uh, did a lot of my Civil War videos, I, uh, I talked about a particular surgeon who was part of the 55th Massachusetts Colored Regiment. Okay, 55th Massachusetts. Yeah, okay. So anyhow, he was an officer. He was a medical officer. And he talks about sweetened condensed milk quite a bit. And he talks about putting sweetened condensed milk on his hardtack and even uh, butter on his hardtack to make it more palatable. So putting sweetened condensed milk on hoe cake isn't that far of a stretch, okay? So this, with sweetened condensed milk, it's almost a dessert. But this could be, it's probably, probably like a breakfast meal, especially with the hot cocoa. Okay, now, Here's my hot cocoa, okay? Now I know if I put my lips to this, I'm gonna get burned, okay? 
even if I didn't dip it in, even if I didn't cook in it, I know if I were to try to drink out of this, it's going to scald me, okay? So, I'm going to take my canteen. I'm going to put just a little bit of water in there to cool it down. Because it's been boiling, you know, for three minutes. It wasn't a royal, rolling boil, but it was boiling. There's some bubbles that's coming up. So I know it's going to be super hot. Mmm, smells good. I'm going to blow on it. I'm kind of scared. So I've been burnt on uh, aluminum before. Once you do it once, it uh, makes you a little trigger shy. Good. I mean, it's a basic hot cocoa recipe, right? You just put some water, put your hot cocoa, and you put some sweetened condensed milk in there, and it's really good. You know, um, I'd even argue it's better than Swiss Miss. <laughs> it's good. All right, so I hope you learned something in review. The Boy Scout Cook Kit started, uh, was being produced and sold Sorry, in 1915. That's when the patent date on this was. And if you look in the Boys Life magazines, it was sold, you know, way back then and, and offered in the Boys Life magazine. My catalogs only go back to 1920. I don't have anything earlier than that. So I can only show pictures from my uh, catalogs during 1920 to 1940. Okay, so that's what those pictures come from. But uh, it's a great cook kit. Just know that aluminum conducts heat twice as much as steel. So you want to keep it elevated. You don't want to put anything directly on the fire or whatever. You can use this for baking. You know, you, you can use it with a lid on top of it as a makeshift uh, Dutch oven, okay? For a personal scout, or even for cooking for maybe two people, this is really all you need. Uh, it gets a bad reputation. I looked on the various discussion boards and people complained about them. I don't know if they were using the uh, newer cook kits with the thinner aluminum. That's what I had when I was a scout. I didn't really like it back then, but also I didn't have somebody who actually taught me the nuances of cooking with it. So if you get this cook kit, cook at home on your stove, cook on a grill just to get used to it and then take it out in the field, cook on the fire, or cook it on a backpacking stove. I don't think you'll be disappointed they're fantastic. They're light and they have all the implements that you really need. I know a lot of bushcrafters uh, tend to use bush pots and you can do a lot in them. I tend to like having a skillet or some type of flat surface because uh, I like to fry foods, you know, when I get a chance. Um, so having this type of cook kit works out for me really, really well. And I suggest they're cheap. Uh, find yourself one on eBay or flea market or something like that. And you can find one on a yard sale. Reach out to some friends. Someone might be an, an older scout and they have one just sitting around they'd be giving, willing to give you. But they're really neat, okay? If you like the video, please click like. If you uh, haven't checked out my other videos on Civil War or Campcraft, check those out. If you do like them, please consider subscribing and helping this channel grow. Share with others who like antiques or artifacts, like history. As a social studies teacher, my goal is to try to get people interested in their history by that material connection. That's how I got hooked on it. The battles, the kings and queens, they're all interesting and all that. But it's really the material culture and the social culture that uh, got me into it. And I'm hoping that it gets you into it as well and uh, you'll like it. I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Give a kiss and hug to your loved ones and take care.